So the gods are returning. Yes, we can expect the return of the ancient gods. And when they arrive, that will be the beginning of the days of Noah. So today we're going to be taking a look at Revelation chapter 9 at the um, fifth trumpet. This is when the bottomless pit is opened, the abyss, Tartarus, where the watchers, that is the sons of God who mated with the daughters of men prior to the flood, where they've been kept in chains for millennia, ready to be released at the great day in time for their judgment. Now, of course, the great day is the day of the Lord. It's when uh, Christ is going to set up his thousand-year millennial kingdom. The day of the Lord will actually begin right at the time that the sixth trumpet sounds, and uh, there's cosmic disturbances, sun goes dark, moon turns to blood. This is the great and terrible day of the Lord. This is when the bowls of wrath will be poured out on the beast and the beast kingdom and on the fallen sons of God, those watchers, those enemies of God who mated with human women. So there's a lot of mythology, a lot of ancient mythology in almost every culture about beings who were like gods. And these were the watchers. These are the stories of the, the sons of God, the fallen angels who, um, well, before they fell, they were assigned to watch over mankind, but then they decided they wanted to be one of us. And so Jude tells us that they left their habitation. And rather than watch over and protect humanity, they wanted to become a part of it. And I'm sure there's reasons for that, that I'm not going to like touch on or delve into today, but I want to sort of emphasize this fact, and that is that the Bible tells us that the gods are returning, the ancient gods are returning, and they're going to be here during that terrible time that we call the tribulation. So in my last video, I talked about hybrids, the hybrids that are among us. These are the people that the book of Revelation refers to as the earth dwellers. They have their counterpart prior to the flood in the Nephilim, that is the uh, the hybrid offspring of the fallen angels and human women. We read this story in Genesis 6 verses 1 through 4. And even though the Nephilim were destroyed at the time of the flood, uh, the scriptures tell us that these hybrids were on earth at that time and also afterward. And we know that there must have been more incursions of fallen angels coming to the earth and mating with human women um, producing giants. And by the way, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew uh, Bible, refers to the Nephilim as the earthborn. Okay, the Greek translation of the Old Testament calls these beings, these hybrid beings, earthborn. This is the translation that John would have been familiar with. And so when we see the earth dwellers in the book of Revelation, this is just another tie-in to the idea that we're talking about hybrids. These are not true humans. And in my last video, I talked about how true humans are those who can trace their ancestry in the book of life. Well, God can trace their ancestry anyway. And I do want to mention something here because I got a lot of comments about people um, who are very concerned if they might be a hybrid, okay? They're believers. If you're a believer, uh, the book of Romans tells us that the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are sons of God or children of God. And if you're a child of God, you're saved. You're, you're not a hybrid, all right? You're not a hybrid. And hybrids do not care if they are uh, in a relationship with God. In fact, they, they are contrary to God. They're opposed to him. So anyone who is even seeking after God or who desires a relationship with God, they're by definition not a hybrid, okay? And I think if you're a hybrid, you, you know that you are. And as people, our names are in a book. 
Uh, Psalm 139 tells us that every day of our life was written in God's book before there was even one of them, before we were even conceived. And God knows those who belong to him. He knows those who belong to him. And if you care about these things, you belong to him, you're not a hybrid, okay? <laughs> you're not a hybrid. So we're going to take a look at uh, Revelation 9 today uh, at the fifth trumpet. I will save the sixth trumpet for another day. But what I want to look at before we do that is the last uh, verse of Revelation 8, because that sort of leads into um, the the passage in Revelation 9. So in Revelation 8, what we see are the first four uh, trumpets that are being blown. So the first four trumpets are actually all going to take place on the same day. And then the fifth trump, the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets are separated out, just like the fifth, sixth, and seventh seal are there, uh, are separated out from the first four seals. So let's take a look at Revelation 8:13. Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. So I'm noticing things now that I didn't notice before. And one of them that I'm noticing here is that this these woes, the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets, woe, 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 are going to be on those who dwell on earth, the earth dwellers. These woes are going to be uh, experienced particularly by these fallen entities who are going to be judged before Christ returns. And remember, the whole tribulation time is, is when God is uh, making a separation. He's putting all the fallen entities on the earth. He's kind of quarantining them here so that when Jesus returns, he can deal with them and throw them into the lake of fire. They're all here and ready to be judged. Believers will all be in heaven, and there will be people on earth who are not a part of, they're not earth dwellers, and they're not people who are going to be judged. They're people from the nations, the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations, who are going to go into the millennium, okay, and populate the millennium, uh, according to Matthew 25. So the three woes are equated with the 5th, 6th, and 7th trumpets, and they're going to affect the earth dwellers. That is, these hybrids are going to feel the effects of these three trumpets the most. The 5th trumpet is the opening of the bottomless pit and the release of the imprisoned angels. That, that is, the watchers who've been put in Tartarus, who are have been in chains in this prison since the time of the flood and you know, perhaps other angels who attempted doing this since then are also there. This pit is going to be opened, okay? And this is going to be not a good thing for the earth dwellers, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The sixth trumpet is when a third of the earth's population is killed. And this is the destruction of Mystery Babylon in a single hour on an hour, day, month, and year that's already been predetermined by God. And the seventh trumpet is when the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So if you're an earth dweller hybrid and you're, you know, sort of working with the harlot and the kings of the earth to run this um, little operation here on earth underneath Satan, well, when Jesus takes over, this is not good for you. The woes are directed toward the earth dwellers, toward these hybrids. The earth dwellers are, like I said, this unique class of non-human individuals who look human and want to pass off as human, and they've been inhabiting the earth for millennia, but they're not true humans. Like the Nephilim of old, they are doomed to destruction. Uh, they try to pass themselves off as humans, and they have illegally wrested the dominion of the earth from those of us who are true sons of Adam. And like I've said before, they are not human. They're not real. They're not real people. So Chuck Missler, uh, I'm just going to quote him for a minute. He says, the Greek Septuagint renders this term, Nephilim, gigantes, which actually means earthborn. This is often misunderstood to mean giants, um, which they also happen to be, 
back in the day, gigantes. But but really what it means is earthborn. We understand that the New Testament writers read the Septuagint as opposed to the Hebrew scriptures and that they they saw this word as an earthborn person. So when you get to Revelation and you see the earth dweller or those who dwell on earth, we know that we're looking at hybrids here. We need to ask some questions here. What is it about these trumpets that's going to be a grief or a woe to this group of entities? What do these hybrids stand to lose? And how will they be affected at each trumpet woe? So we'll answer these questions as we go along as well as taking a deep dive into the fifth trumpet in Revelation chapter 9. So I'm going to read this passage. It's rather long. It's Revelation 9, uh, 1 through 12. Listen to it with new ears, okay? And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And he opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. And then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. And they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people... Okay, notice this is, a, this is the word people, not earth dwellers, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Okay, and this is men will seek death. This word is amp anthropos it's it's man in appearance the locusts were like horses prepared for battle and on their heads were what looked like crowns of gold their faces were like human faces their hair like women's hair and their teeth like lion's teeth and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle and they have tails and stings like scorpions and their power to hurt men for five months is in their tails, and they have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, and his name in Hebrew, in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he's called Apollyon. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. So this passage, like I said, describes the release of the angels who are kept bound at the bottomless pit. I know a lot of people like to focus on the whole locust thing here, but what we need to do is focus on who these entities are. And then we have a description, okay, of they have, you know, hair like women and faces like men. But all this is, is basically symbolism that fleshes out or expands on you know, they're the characteristics of who these angels are and how they're going to sort of appear when they're released from the pit. They're not locusts. They're not insects. They're not scorpions. Okay. These are angels who are kept bound in the bottomless pit. And they're not ordinary angels. These are those sons of God who were uh, mated with human women and were relegated to the pit for their misdeeds. The Nephilim or the earthborn, their offspring, they were destroyed in the flood, okay? So the Nephilim, uh, their bodies died. They drowned in the flood. But because they weren't fully human or fully angel, um, if they were fully angel, they would have gone into the pit like their fathers. If they're fully human, they'd have gone to Sheol, which is the place of the dead where the dead await. A resurrection but because once their bodies died they their souls didn't have any place to go their spirits didn't have any place to go so they roam the earth and because they do not qualify for a resurrection body of any kind at any time they are always looking for a body that they can inhabit so they're they're the demons that are on earth to this very day. The demons are the spirits of the Nephilim who died in the flood. Genesis 6 describes the incursion of fallen angels 
And this passage also informs us that there were subsequent incursions that happened after the flood. So I'll just read th this passage. And like I said, there's a, a, a great video that Chuck Missler did. And uh, thanks, Jen, for uh, sending me the link. And I think it, it'd be very enlightening. Uh, if you don't know this, most, <laughs> most of the time this isn't stuff that's taught from the pulpit or taught in Sunday school. So uh, you may not really know much about this. So I recommend heartily uh, Chuck Missler's video on the Nephilim. Genesis 6, uh, verse 1. When man began to multiply in the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took as wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim, or earthborn, were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. Okay. When the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. These are the people, the, um, the hybrids that uh, the myths, the ancient myths tell their stories. Okay, The gods of old are these hybrid um, entities. Peter also mentions this group of angels in his second letter, 2 Peter 2, 4, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell or Tartarus and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. And then here's a reference from Jude 6. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, that is, they left the proper kind of body, that they had. He has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. The angels who procreated with human women will be kept in chains until the great day. Okay, what's the great day? Well, the great day is the day of the Lord. <laughs> They're going to be kept in chains until the day of the Lord. So even though these angels are in a terrible place right now, once they're judged, they will enter an even worse place and they will be there forever. Their final destination is the lake of fire. So the judgment of these angels is actually on the docket. It's scheduled for the great day. This is the day that will begin with darkness and not light. It will. It's the day of the Lord that begins right after the signs of the sixth seal, the signs that we also read about in Matthew 24. The great day will begin with the wrath of God with the seven bowls of wrath. And when he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth. And then skip down to um, verse 16, when the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and so on call to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? And the passage in Matthew 24, 29 to 30, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Okay, so the Lord is going to send a fallen angel that's symbolized by this star that falls from heaven and is given the key. And he's going to open the bottomless pit. So why is God using a fallen angel? Why doesn't he just use one of his regular angels to open up the pit? Well, I have a hypothesis, and basically it's it's a twofold hypothesis, and both one or both of these may be true, or maybe neither one, but this is my thinking. The first one is that God wants to spare the holy angels from having to execute what may be a very unpleasant task. And the second reason is that by using a fallen angel to open the pit, um, God may be 
doing a fake out um, on those fallen angels. If you have a fallen angel opening the pit, it may look like there's a an insider fallen angel who's gotten the key and can like spring you like a jailbreak. And to make it look like they're being released before the great day, because they actually are, <laughs> they're being released, um, oh, at least, um, you know, two to three years uh, before the millennium, before the great day begins. So it's a, it looks like they're being released early, okay, before the judgment is scheduled to happen. And they're very aware of when the judgment is going to happen. In fact, uh, demons, when Jesus was casting demons out of people, um, they said, are you going to judge us before the time. So they understood that there was a time when they were going to be judged and it hadn't arrived yet when at Jesus first coming. So God probably wants to promote this appearance of a jailbreak to make it look like they're being released before the great day, before the time of judgment, because they actually are. And what will happen now is that the fallen angels who are released are going to attempt to co-opt actual human bodies. That is, it's kind of a, the invasion of the body snatchers. They need 100% human bodies in the hopes that they can actually uh, claim the earth. Remember, God gave dominion to the earth to mankind, to nobody else. Uh, you have to be... Uh, you know, a human being, someone created from the dust of the ground, someone who can trace their lineage back to Adam and the book of life, the book of life of mankind. And if you can do that, well, then you um, are someone who can, you know, legally have dominion over the earth. So, you know, a lot of people think or have promoted the idea that um, a kind of a hybrid race is going to take over, you know, and that people's uh, who have altered DNA are going to somehow or another, you know, that the beast is someone with altered DNA and that we want to have a altered humanity um, for the end times. And nothing could be further from the truth. What these entities want are 100% real humans because they want to technically be able to, to rule the earth, to have dominion over the earth. And this is sort of a divine law. God gave dominion to mankind. So the sons of God, um, they're also called the watchers in the book of Enoch. So I'll sometimes use that term as well as sons of God or the angels from the pit. There's a number of, of ways that these, this group can be described. But they're, they're pure fallen angel. Okay? They're not hybrids like the earth dwellers. And they have actually more power and more authority than the earth dwellers do. So these are beings that you see wearing crowns, crowns of gold, which indicates a sort of d divinity. Gold is the metal of divinity. And when you see uh, the 24 elders in heaven, they have crowns of gold on their heads. And these beings have crowns like gold. Okay, it says light gold. They're not actually divine beings, but they're trying to pass themselves off as a kind of divine being. And they're very powerful. In fact, these beings are so powerful that they had to be put in chains and put in the lowest pit that, that's imaginable. Okay, and they're being released onto the earth now. And they are far more powerful than any earth dweller. And they have a much higher status than any earth dweller. And even though the earth dwellers have part human bodies, and, you know, because of that, they feel that technically they can help rule the earth or whatever. If these fallen angels can actually slip into a, a human body, a real human body, then they will have far more authority than the earth dwellers will. And they will have succeeded in doing what a hybrid could not do, which is like passing themselves off as 100% human. So the earth dwellers stand to lose a lot of power um, once the angels from the pit are released onto the earth. So the angels from the pit will be seeking real humans 
to inhabit. All right. They will not be allowed to torture anyone who has the seal of God on their forehead. In other words, if you're a Christian, and remember the 144,000 are going to be sealed, and actually there's kind of a hurry to get them sealed before the first four trumpet angels blow their trumpets, remember, that harm the earth and the sea and, and so on, because it's only you know, just days later that the fifth trumpet will sound, and I'll give you dates for all this at the end, that the fifth trumpet will sound, and if you have to be sealed by then. Okay, so we know the 144,000 will be sealed by then, and so will um, multitudes of people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. They will be uh, sealed in the Holy Spirit too. So all the people who are Christians are entirely off limits. They cannot be tormented by these angels who come from the bottomless pit. Verse 4 of Revelation 9, they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. So like I said earlier, this word for man or men is uh, Strong's number 444, anthropos, which is the generic term for mankind. This is, this is humanity. Any human who does not have the seal of God, who is not a Christian, is fair game. And the earth dwellers are excluded because they're already hybrids. These watcher angels do not want to get into a hybrid body. They want 100% human. That's why they're going after the Anthropos, mankind. So these entities, they're not locusts. They're not insects. These are angels who are seeking a body. They're not going to harm vegetation, of course, and they're, they're not going to harm the earth dwellers because they don't want the hybrid bodies. They're looking for real human bodies. Because, like I said, if they can inhabit a 100% human, genetically human body, they can claim dominion over the earth on a technicality. Okay, And we know that angels can inhabit human bodies. Satan was able to inhabit Judas. He entered into him on the night that Jesus was betrayed. So we know it's possible for angels to indwell someone. John 13, 27. And when Judas had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. And then Jesus said to Judas, What you're about to do, do quickly. So the watchers are not going to be permitted to harm anyone with the seal of God. The seal of God is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that's placed inside of Christians. So 144,000 of Israel will have the seal of God, and others will as well. The fallen watchers, the sons of God, are going to seek out true humans who are not born again. These angels will attempt to enter into people, but first the person has to die. And their body has to be emptied or devoid of a spirit or a soul. And then the fallen ones can enter into that body and basically re-energize it. Because remember, the scriptures tell us that the body apart from the spirit is dead. Okay, So death is not caused by cessation of physical life. It's caused when the spirit leaves the body. The, the body apart from the spirit is dead. So... If you have a body that's dead and then it's re-energized uh, by a spirit, it can be resurrected again, okay, or revived. Let's, let's call it revived. They can be revived. If a true human dies, especially if they willingly die, then the fallen angel spirit can slip into that body, that earth suit, and now they have this clothing, this habitation of this 100% human body that they can now live in and claim dominion over the earth. The watcher angels, though, are told that they cannot kill people. They're not allowed to kill people. They can torment them. They can torture them. Um, and I think that they hope that if they can torture people enough, 
that perhaps these people will want to kill themselves in order to end the nightmare. The problem is, is that they're not going to be able to die. Okay, and this is where it gets kind of kind of odd. And, and um, it can seem, you know, really strange unless you can go back to Revelation chapter 1 and read a verse there, and then all of a sudden things start to become clear. Why can't these people die? Well, number one, we know that Jesus holds the keys to death in Hades. And that's Revelation 1.18. Jesus is the one who controls who dies and who doesn't. And he's not going to allow the people that these fallen angels are wanting to inhabit, he's not going to allow those people to die. Even if they try to kill themselves, he's not going to allow them to die. So this, I think, is where a lot of the whole zombie stuff comes from, where people can do all manner of things to try to kill themselves, but still not be able to die. And Jesus is not going to allow these people to die, and there's, there's a reason for that. And we'll get into that here in just a minute. But I want to talk about the plus side of this, okay? There's a reason why Jesus isn't going to allow these people to die. It's because he wants them to get saved, okay? He wants them to get saved. So there's, there's two passages in Scripture that um, sort of have a pattern here. And remember, prophecy is pattern. We're always looking to find some kind of pattern somewhere else in Scripture that we can point to and say this is a pattern for, for what we see in Revelation. So in John 3, verses 14 through 17, there is this really kind of bizarre passage uh, that where Jesus is actually alluding back to the book of Numbers. So we're jumping from Revelation to the Gospel of John to the book of Numbers. So let's take a look at John 3, 14 through 17. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So here we have Jesus using this really bizarre example from the Exodus, and uh, we'll read the passage um, it, that's actually, it's recorded in the book of Numbers. But Moses uh, was instructed to make a brazen serpent and put it on a pole. And that's what Jesus is referring to here. So let's take a look at the passage in Numbers 21. And this is verses 4 through 9. From Mount Hor they set out by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. They're speaking of manna there. And then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned, we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So this is a very bizarre picture. And Jesus compares that bronze serpent on a pole to his crucifixion, to himself, actually. And it's a very bizarre comparison. But what he said was that if someone is stung by one of these serpents, all he has to do is look to Christ and he will be healed and he'll live. And I think this is an illustration that's in the Bible. It's in two places here because this is going to be applicable during the end times, that if regular humans are being stung by these watcher angels and are being tormented by them, 
if they will turn to the Lord, they will be healed and they will be sealed. They'll be healed of this sin problem. They'll be healed of whatever they've done to themselves and they will be sealed in the Holy Spirit. And I think in this way, many, 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 many people are going to come to the Lord. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of people who will turn to Christ at that time. Jesus is always wanting to save people. He, he is going to keep saving people up until the very, very, very end. Here's the second reason that I believe that Jesus is not going to allow people to die and be indwelt by these watchers uh, for five months. Okay, The first reason was I think he wants to save more people. And the second reason is that the beast or the Antichrist has to be killed at the right time. And the beast, the, the, that seventh king, the rider on the white horse, has to die on Passover. Okay, there has to be this counterfeit thing happening. Now the pit is going to open in November. So there has to be five months between, um, you know, about five months between when the pit is opened and when finally these watcher angels are allowed to inhabit humans. But the beast has to be the first fruits of that. The, this Antichrist, seventh king person, is going to be the first fruits, the, the counterfeit of Christ. The first fruits to rise from the dead be and be indwelt by Apollyon, who is the angel who ascends from the bottomless pit. He's the beast that ascends from the bottomless pit. The seventh king will die on Passover. He'll rise on first fruits as the beast who ascends from the bottomless pit. He'll be a hybrid, but in an odd sort of way. He has a body that's 100% human. It's not a hybrid body. It's a 100% human body, but the spirit of Apollyon lives inside of it. He'll be resurrected on first fruits. Then three and a half days later, on the day that we know of as the abomination of desolation, which is also, the, it's the day of the sixth trumpet or the second woe, okay? Remember the opening of the, the pit is the first woe, and the second woe will happen um, when that first woe is over. So three and a half days after the beast rises from the dead, that will be the end of five months, the end of 150 days. On the day of the abomination or the sixth trumpet, that's when the dragon, Satan, is going to give all of his authority, his authority, his throne, his power, everything to the beast. And remember, a man rules the earth. Okay? A man rules the earth. Man has dominion over the earth. The false antichrist beast receives authority from his father, the dragon, that is a counterfeit glorification. And that's when all the rest of the watcher angels can now inhabit a regular human body, a pure, real human body, and then they will be in the image of the beast. The image of the beast is not an idol. The image of the beast is human bodies who are indwelt by watcher angels who are now like the Antichrist. It's all a counterfeit of what happens with believers. Christ died on Passover. He rose on first fruits. Okay, then Christ ascended on first fruits. He was glorified so that he was able to give the Holy Spirit to believers the apostles on that day of first fruits. And then uh, 50 days later, there was this pen Pentecost experience when the Holy Spirit came down as a double portion um, for the apostles and the 120 and the 3,000. In this case, it's just slightly different. The beast is killed on Passover, it rises on first fruits. Three and a half days later, he's basically glorified and given authority. And after that, the a uh, false prophet can put spirit or breath into people. It creates the image of the beast. That's in Revelation 13. 
And it's only then, at the end of the five months, that select humans, and I think they will be select humans, when, when they see that the seventh king died and rose as a basically a god, that if they willingly lay down their life, they will be resurrected as a demigod, as a little god. And remember, people have to worship the image of the beast. Okay, and it's not just one um, person that you know that's going to have the image. There will be a lot of people who carry carry the image of the beast. Right? People were made in the image of God. Believers are being transformed into the image of Christ. We're talking about people who are reflecting the image of whoever their God is. So the Antichrist reflects that image of the dragon, we reflect the image of Christ. Adam was a reflection of, of God when God made him and made, uh, made people in his image. So once regular human people see that this there's a potential to be as gods, which was sort of that promise from the garden, that if they can become gods, that they'll willingly lay down their life in order to be inhabited by one of these watcher angels and then become a demigod. I don't think they realize that they're going to lose themselves in this, that their, their spirit is going to be lost in this, that they're not going to be able to come back into their body, that it's actually going to be another spirit that's going to inhabit their body, and their spirit is going to be, uh, go to Sheol to await the resurrection of the dead. At, um, at the great white throne judgment. So again, I just want to reiterate this, that the image of the beast is not an idol or a statue. There's actually a different word that's used in the book of Revelation when, when we're talking about idols, and it's the word idol. It's not the word image. It's in Revelation chapter 9 where people don't stop worshiping idols of gold and silver and so on. The image of the beast is something entirely different. It is not a statue that's set up in the temple or something like that. All right, Revelation 9, let's look at verse 7. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, and their hair like women's hair and their teeth like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. And they have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt men for five months is in their tails. And they have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, and his name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he's called Apollyon. So once... Um, these watchers are released from the pit. They're ready to do battle. Okay, they are ready to do battle. And a horse. There, it says they look. Um, they look like horses prepared for battle. A horse is a war animal. Okay, if you want an animal for peace, you ride on a donkey. War animals were horses. And next, what we see is that they have crowns of gold on their heads. So they are royalty. They are kings. They are sort of like the 24 elders uh, who we have as Christ, our king, who's in our midst. And these are the, the angels from the bottomless pit who are wearing crowns who have Apollyon as their king. So it's a counterfeit of what we see in heaven. They have faces like men. That is, they, they actually are going to look like people. I, I don't think they're going to look like some kind of weird image that we see, you know, in the old medieval books, I think they're going to look like people. And most of the imagery that we see here is actually symbolic. It, it tells us something about them, not necessarily how they look. But I think they will look like humans. They're going to have uh, women's hair. And hair um, is sort of a youthful thing. You know, when you get older, you kind of lose your hair. So it, it it's youthful, and if you have hair like a woman, uh, supposedly women have long, beautiful hair, and their hair is supposed to be, you know, sed seductive. And I think there is going to be that seductive aspect about these fallen angels. 
With their lion's teeth, they have the ability to tear their prey to shreds, and people are their prey. Okay, they're going to prey on people, on real humans. They're unconquerable, as symbolized by the breastplates of iron. You can try to, to you know, come against them. You're not going to be able to. And like thousands of locusts, they will descend on the earth in a mad rush to obtain a human body. All right, they are, there's... You know, uh, the book of Enoch says there's was like, I think, 500 or 200, you know, watchers. I don't remember the exact number, but it was in the hundreds. But what we see here are, are like really thousands of these that are coming out. It's, it's a lot more than what we're told in the book of Enoch because there's been incursions that have taken place since then. And I think that once those incursions happen, eventually those fallen angels actually are placed in the pit. I don't think that they are allowed to keep on doing that sort of thing. In any case, there's going to be a lot more of these angels than we really have any idea of. And I think that these watcher angels may intuitively know that whoever among them is first to acquire a human body will become the Antichrist. They'll become the king. And they most likely have no idea exactly which one of these mortal people uh, it may be. I don't know that they know. Uh, we know that the, the rider on the white horse is most likely that seventh king who is going to be a warrior. He's on a war horse. He has arrows. Um, he's given a crown. In other words, he's going to be a ruler. He's given a, the rulership um, after he comes off as a war hero. But there can be more than one of those. So they may not know exactly uh, who it is that is going to end up being that person we know of as the Antichrist. And remember, the Antichrist isn't revealed until the abomination of desolation. Because he doesn't exist until he has died and resurrected and has been indwelt by Apollyon. He's just a king. He's just a man. He's just the seventh king. He isn't anybody um, until he's indwelt by Apollyon. So if at all possible, uh, these watcher angels may want to uh, push out their king, Apollyon, and, you know, try to find the body first and, you know, indwell that body and be the first one so that they can be uh, the head honcho who rules the earth. And just like Satan tempted all the disciples, trying to find the one who would become the son of perdition, I think these fallen angels may also be on the hunt for the one who is the Antichrist. So remember at the Last Supper, Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And all the people looked at Jesus and they said, is it me? Am I the one? And I think the reason they did that, because every single one of them had been tempted to betray Christ. These uh, beings are said to have tails. Now, tails identify these angels as beasts, because people don't have tails, but animals do. Spiritually speaking, a beast is someone who has no sensitivity toward God, who is anti-God. Okay, they do not want to follow him and they resist him. That's what being a beast is. And if you have a tail, it shows that you're a beast. The book of Daniel describes uh, several earthly kings as being beasts. And this includes um, a fourth beast in the book of Daniel, who we identify with, um, we identify as the Antichrist. So Daniel 7:7. 7, 7, and after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth, and it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So sometimes uh, a tail can have a sexual connotation, but I don't think that's the case here because these angels are not going to have offspring. That is not the goal. They don't have time to procreate. And in fact, they don't want their children to rule. They want to rule. And the only way they can do that is if they actually can inhabit a 100% human body. 
So this is kind of bad news for the earth dwellers, and it's something that they may not have expected to happen, you know, once their father, you know, sons of God, those fallen angels actually appear on earth. They do not really care about the earth dwellers. The earth dwellers are going to have to worship them because in the hierarchy, you've got Satan, you've got um, the Antichrist, then you have all these watchers who are going to inhabit human bodies. This is the image of the beast. And everybody's going to have to worship the beast and the image of the beast. During the millennium, you have God the Father. You have Jesus. You have the, uh, the kings and priests who are going to rule and reign with Christ. And you have then the rest of the people who are on earth. And the people on earth, according to what we read in uh, Revelation chapter 3, are going to worship at our feet. That means they're going to acknowledge that we are a little bit higher on the spiritual hierarchy than they are. They have to acknowledge that we have a higher rank. So in the book of Revelation, we read about the dragon and he has a tail. And let's see what he does with his tail. Revelation 12, 3 and 4. And another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. And his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. So the dragon is Satan. That's what Revelation tells us. And he's described as having a tail, and he uses his tail to compel or force a third of the fallen angels who are in heaven to be swept to the earth. He makes them do something that they don't necessarily want to do. And he uses his tail to do that. So in like manner, the angels from the pit will use their tails to force themselves on humanity. The painful stings inflicted by the fallen sons of God are intended to motivate people to perhaps commit suicide, which will result in a body for them to indwell. And if there's enough pain, they believe that people will eventually try to kill themselves just to have relief. However, I don't think they're aware that for five months they're not going to be able to do that. So their plans are going to be foiled when Christ will not allow any of those people to die. Here's something else to think about. The watchers may actually try to seduce humans and, and get them to willingly lay down their life, to willingly die, with promises of becoming gods if they're willing to donate their body <laughs> to these spirits who will inhabit them. Okay, let's just, let's just summarize what we've got so far. The three woes, the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet, will have significant impact on the hybrid earth dwellers, these non-human entities who, alongside the harlot and the kings of the earth, have basically been running the show under Satan's control for millennia. Uh, the second thing is, the hybrid earth dwellers will realize that they've lost their position of authority over the earth, when these higher ranking angels exit the pit and take on the bodies of real, genetically pure humans. The third thing is the angels from the pit will seek a human body to inhabit. And since they will not be allowed to kill people outright, they will torment them so badly that people will attempt to kill themselves. Christ, however, will not permit these people to die. Okay and not until the end of five months. Number four, once the seventh king, the rider on the white horse, has been killed, most likely by the two witnesses, that will be just before the end of their 1,260 days. Once the seventh king has been killed, he will resurrect, and he'll become the first fruits from the dead, now indwelled by Apollyon, and three and a half days later, he will be given Satan's authority. And number five, upon the Antichrist's rise to power on the day of, abomination, of the abomination, when he's given Satan's power, throne, and great authority, this is also the day of the sixth trumpet and the second woe, the Antichrist's fellow watcher angels will finally be permitted to inhabit the bodies of humans. And 
That will be the definition of the image of the beast. And they will appear as demigods and they will require worship. All right, so the way you do the timeline in the book of Revelation is you work it backward. You work everything backward. God has already um, established his plan of redemption um, at the end, and he is working the plan backward and then starting it and moving it forward through time. So if you want to do the timeline in Revelation, you actually have to work it backward. So we start with the Day of Atonement, and we're going to use the year 2027, um, that's assuming a 2023 rapture. Okay, and by the way, there's no seven-year tribulation. The Jews only have three and a half years or 42 months. And then there's just a little bit of time before the events that we read about in Revelation take place. So the timeline is worked backward from the Day of Atonement. Okay, that's when Christ returns on the Day of Atonement. And if we subtract 1,260 days, uh, we will arrive at the Day of the Sixth Trumpet, the Abomination of Desolation, that the end of the five months for the Watcher Angels. So if the Day of Atonement is September 12th, 2027, the Abomination, the end of the five months, uh, is uh, March 31st and to April 1st of 2024. First fruits when the beast rises from the dead will, is March 27th, 2024. The day that the beast is slain is Passover, and that's March 25th, 2024. The pit will be opened on the anniversary of the day that Noah's flood began. Okay, and that's 1st, 2nd of November, 2023, and that means there needs to be a rapture on October 8th of 2023, and that is the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. All right, so if you're interested in seeing um, my timeline for all of this, there's a link to that in the description box. I have a lot of resources that are available. I hope you will check them out. Um, they're really good, I think. I think they're really good resources, and I've had so much help from so many people making these available to you. So I hope you will download them. I hope you'll get everything that um, is available to you. And I hope you'll check out some of my other videos as well. I have hundreds of them. And I would start with the playlist and in specific, uh, probably the Days of Noah playlist. And then also there is a playlist that um, is uh, called Salvation. And I think that's a good playlist to start with too, um, especially if um, you have any questions about what it means to be saved. All right, so um, thank you for watching, and uh, we'll see you on another video. Till then, have a blessed day. <music>